Hey everyone. Uh, I noticed that uh, two days ago when you guys had to uh, share some fun facts, uh, I think it was still not so easy yet for you guys to come up with some original things. So when we talk about finding a fit and kind of sharing something interesting about you guys, I think part of it I think that we want to share today after the experience of building Impossible for the last two years. I think um, there's a lot of things that we want to share a little bit today and how to hopefully package you guys into uh, that fit that we want to see for every project team. I think Sky mentioned a lot of very interesting points. I'll try and tie in some of the lessons that hopefully you guys have picked up from her uh, just before to uh, hopefully give you guys some useful insights from a accelerator or builder's perspective. Uh, so obviously, uh, I'm Calvin. Uh, I guess I maybe some of you guys know that I used to be ex-finance, so maybe that's the big thing on my resume. But hopefully, uh, I'm not sure if this is working. OK, there you go. Um, uh, used to be ex-finance, and so maybe that's something that you guys are familiar with, but hopefully what people will remember today is uh, the hard work that we're doing at Impossible and the things that we've been able to learn on this journey and working hands-on with a lot of project teams like you guys. Um, so Impossible does a lot of things, and I think this is something that I wanted to share a little bit to give you guys a bit of insights of how I think over the last two years we've spent a lot of time to find our own fit as well. Uh, you know, in our oldest decks, we used to always put this thing where we're an accelerator, we're a launch pad, we're a swap. But the problem is we never really thought about how many people know what an accelerator is, how many people know what a launch pad is, and how many people know what a swap is. Raise your hand if you know what all three of those things are. Okay, maybe like 45% of the room. So that, but of course, you guys are quite deep into crypto. If I told you that every day that when we were putting all of our materials out there, that 55% of the people that we were speaking to had no clue what the three words that we put on our deck was. We hadn't found the fit. And I think that's something that in kind of sharing some of the old materials that Impossible has had, uh, I tried to not edit any slides that are explaining Impossible, but to just kind of see that journey. Um, I was lucky enough to actually, sorry for the low quality picture. Uh, I was inspired by uh, Poom's picture yesterday, but I found this snippet from last year's block camp where uh, Tan Vu was just here. Uh, and O uh, were on a panel last year. And I think it's really cool to see uh, another iteration of this block camp uh, in, in this type of uh, blockathon. Uh, but last year, obviously, SCB uh, was really great, grateful for O in uh, letting me come over uh, last year to come and speak with some of the builders that were creating projects at a one week long hackathon. So, really excited to see what you guys build this year as well. Um, so I, I tried to rip exactly the decks that we've actually used from even uh, within the last six months uh, about Impossible. And I think when you're trying to build something, in order to say you have some sort of fit, right? I think you have to have a clear vision of what you want to actually do and a vision of what you believe should exist within the world, right? Um, for us uh, you know, at Impossible, we think it's very clear that fairness and accessibility is really core to why we want to exist. A lot of investment platforms exist out there. Uh, raise your hand if, if you've invested in crypto. Uh, I think a good amount of everyone, right? But the question is, that's also one of the reasons where I want to test this question. How many of you have invested in something that's not crypto? OK, I think slightly less hands. And so that's something that I think is core to some of crypto's uh, essence. That for us, whether it's using DEXs or creating other uh, protocols and platforms, that there are a lot more things that you have access to make investments into. And we want to push that even further in giving even more high quality investment opportunities for regular users and have a clear, fair mechanism for users to be able to have these investments, right? Um, everything that we do, if it doesn't help this, is not making us a better us. And I think every team here, we hope that you guys find one of these types of things where Every time someone asks you, why do you even need to have this thing, you can point at this thing and you have every teammate know this by heart. Because if you can quiz any of the guys wearing Impossible t-shirts today, I'm pretty confident they'll be able to tell you this without needing to look at this slide. Uh, and then mission, you know, sometimes I think people confuse vision and mission. And I think uh, I have to shout out Gareth uh, from our team for having spent a lot of time in making clear these two things, because I don't think we had this figured out when we were first building. Um, but we see there's kind of three steps on what we want to help with. And I think that 
Uh, and this is for specifically the user side because as a marketplace, and I'm sure that some of the products that you guys are building are two-sided marketplaces where you may have different constituents that you need to serve. Uh, in this case, for our users, the mission that we want to do is guide these users to learn, discover, and invest. And I'll dive a little bit deeper into the user uh, journey and finding the fit for your users or the audience that you want to serve as well. Uh, but that this is something that, again, every teammate at Impossible can resonate with this because some of us, we are users ourselves. We can put ourselves in this shoe. And we know that maybe when we first started within crypto, we didn't know where we could learn about crypto. We didn't know where we could discover new deals. And we didn't know where we could actually put our money in to make these investments. And if we can solve that, we can solve at least our own case, our, our own use cases, right? Um, and that's where I think finding that fit of knowing the, the shoes of the customer uh, and, and how you can fit in those, I think that's really, really important in being able to address the, the needs that they have. Um, so obviously this is some jargon, right? But what we really want to put together is that there's one place where both product teams and users can come to be able to make investments in crypto. That's why Impossible needs to exist. Find this statement for you guys yourselves. Uh, that will be the challenge that I would love for each of you guys to uh, figure out. And when you figure it out, come find one of us wearing Impossible t-shirts today. Yeah, so obviously I think um, there are a lot of things that are still not yet, uh, I would say, robust within crypto. And I think that's why we want to have hackathons like this where you guys are tackling a lot of different problems that may be related to some of these. These are just some of the things that we see are like the problem statements, right? And with every problem, part of what we want to see you guys be able to build is the solutions for maybe not everything all at once, but at least one of the things that you feel like is a burning pain I think this ties to this guy's previous comment about like find the people that are willing to pay you. Uh, I think oftentimes uh, VCs like to say the painkiller versus vitamin kind of thing. If you solve someone's like really, really deep pain, like maybe I lost money in a hack last week, then I'm going to be like, yeah, I want to pay for security, right? But if it's like, oh, it would be nice if we had some better security, a lot of people won't be willing to pay for the vitamins that are maybe healthier for you, but they haven't been burnt. In the wake of things like the FTX hack, uh, FTX uh, rug, and other hacks in crypto, right? There's a lot of things where these different pieces will sometimes become bigger pains for different audiences within crypto, right? I think it's up to you guys to be able to make each of your initiatives and projects relate to hopefully as many of these pains that different people have within crypto. So each of these things can have some sort of solution or some sort of strategy that is tied to what you want to be able to build. And if you can find out why your product is most useful in doing something here that solves the risk, these are the opportunities for you guys to be able to solve. So a part of the fit that I like to kind of say, uh, I'll call it founder narrative fit. Sometimes you need to be able to explain to people why are you the person that's best fit to solve this uh, problem, right? There are a lot of problems to solve, like, uh, for example, world hunger. I would love to solve world hunger, but I literally have nothing I can do that uh, from any of my experiences or all the things that uh, I've learned to particularly solve this problem. I would love to figure out I don't know, alternative meats or uh, bio whatever things, right? But why me? I, I really have no experience on this. And so if I come with this idea to a hackathon, it might be a great idea but I'm going to be starting from square zero to convince people why I'm the right person to try and solve this problem. And I think for all of you guys, I will also want to challenge you guys to explain why are you the best person to build each of these different projects. So we'll, we'll touch on this a, a little bit later as well. Um, but Impossible has this two-sided marketplace bit, right? One of the th reasons why we will say why us is because we've actually had different experiences that help on each stage of acquiring the two sides of the different marketplaces that we have. A lot of our teammates, even our, for example, lovely developer team, actually our three developers that we have here or, uh, and our uh, QA teammate, uh, they actually come from two-sided marketplaces as well. Uh, Calvin comes from Grab, uh, Riz comes from Bukalapa, and uh, Sili comes from Food Panda. Uh, so we've got all of these guys that have thought a lot about two-sided marketplaces even when they're a developer at Impossible, not just the BD side, but they understand the complex problems that are needed when you're trying to solve two-sided marketplace problems, right? Or multi-sided marketplace problems. And so when we're thinking about how to help 
project teams and be the best version of ourselves, we have different people that we can say we can do different parts. So if I want to say I want to prove why I'm the person that is the best person to educate people within crypto, has anyone ever used Binance Academy? Uh, it's like a glossary of these uh, definitions of crypto. I wrote the first version of that. I can say that I was one of the first people in crypto to want to believe in educating people and I can point this link and say this is me. This is the work I did and this is the work that I believe that crypto should have. So that if I want to talk about anything about educating users, I think I have the credible resume for that. And you guys can find the same types of points like this within your own experiences, within the things that you're passionate about and be able to point back at this maybe on-chain, maybe off-chain resume of things that you're really excited about. But then every room that you walk into, if people remember that you're that guy that did this and this is something that is important for what you want to build today, that's, you are the guy. There's no doubt. That's the why us, right? Uh, and hopefully each one of your teammates has this piece to some part of the whole big system that you eventually want to build yourselves. So yeah, then the second question is why this problem, right? I'll pick on KC because I know KC, right? Uh, why Carrot uh, and, and uh, seeing the future, right? If, if there might be a lot of talented people in this room, right? But you need to also explain to people exactly why this is the most important thing that you can do with your time because there's clearly a lot of talented people in this room. That's why SCV's spent the time to filter you guys to come and be a part of, of this ha hackathon, right? And so I'll, I'll, I'll let you share maybe later in uh, the latter part of this, but I want to challenge uh, every teammate uh, in, in, in each of your teams to be able to explain why do you want to spend this time rather than, it's a public holiday today, right? Why not go and explore Bangkok or what was the joke uh, going back to Pattaya before noon? You know, you need to understand why this is the most important thing for this time of your life to be spent on this, right? Um, and I think we'll touch a little bit more on this later as well. Um, for us, because we're a two-sided marketplace, we also need to understand the other side of our business model, which is working with project teams, right? As an accelerator and working with teams like you guys, sometimes we work with teams very, very early stage, right? So sometimes it's at the hackathon stage that we do some of our product di pro project discovery. You know, some of the earliest stuff that we made investments or other project uh, involvement in uh, come from the earliest stages, but also uh, th we have to be open-minded to figure out where and how we can achieve this type of project discovery, right? Then we conduct our due diligence, challenge the project teams that we meet, and really try to push them to do some different things that maybe they haven't thought of before, right? And then at one further stage, right, we go further in figuring out how we can engage with the project teams that uh, we work with. Uh, such that we can say, yes, these are teams that uh, we've made a meaningful impact in actually doing something that lets them uh, be able to be very active. So uh, I'll, I'll use Casey as the easy example, given that he's from Huga. So at Impossible, we were an investor in Huga, and that one of the things that Huga has previously been doing was uh, uh, related to our metaverse talk just before. Uh, they were very active in a lot of different uh, games and metaverse ecosystems. And so actually one of the things that we just finished last month is that uh, Huga and Impossible work together to actually uh, participate in the land gameplay of Axie Infinity, such that we were in the leaderboard, what were we, top number three uh, in, in all the world of uh, different uh, metaverse players, where they had people that were tending the lands inside our ecosystem, and we had made some investment in these lands, so that our portfolio project did not have to pay the upfront capital to utilize these lands and showcase how good they are within a metaverse ecosystem. And that at the same time, we were able to learn a lot more about how these different ecosystems work. Um, so I think a lot of the things that we do as a project uh, incubator or accelerator is in this engagement step. Uh, and we hope that each of your projects, you figure out what is your engagement step. Because a lot of this engagement step will be the why you because if this gives you energy, if I get to geek out about Metaverse lands with KC and it gives me energy and it gives me new knowledge that I can take to all the other teams that are building in uh, NFTs or Metaverses to be able to have some uh, learnings that I can share with them so that when I talk to uh, Megan or anyone else on all of these different things that uh, are related to Metaverses, I have more ammunition for every conversation I have and that makes me really happy, right? 
And so find that piece, because that piece will also be a bit of the why you. Yeah, so yeah, these are just some impossible <coughs> things, so I'll skip forward. Um, and then we also have this journey for the users, and I think, uh, as Sky mentioned, uh, a lot of user testing and the user interview piece will be important in understanding a little bit more of what are the things that you do to better understand your user. We, right now at Impossible, are still working on a lot of different things that give us more touch points uh, and more feedback on how to increase the number of users, the stickiness of our users, so on and so forth. And I, I would be the first to admit that I don't think we're perfect yet at this, but it's something that a lot of the work that we will need to do in order to be the best version of our project, we will need to figure out ways where we can engage our users and get this feedback from the users before we can really get a nice kind of compounding network effect of good users referring uh, their friends to come use our project uh, and product after they've had a good experience, right? Yeah, so hopefully these two things in, in our product kind of compound each other and I challenge you guys to find your own flywheels or other compounding pieces where if you get this and if you get this, ooh, that's gonna be really good. You need to find these, right? Because these are the things that allow you as a project to be able to scale even more the impact that you're able to do. <laughs> yep, and then understanding some more types of users. We do a lot of user persona uh, thinking so that maybe not every user is created equal. And I think you guys need to also figure out what types of users you might be solving and what types of individual initiatives you may have to get them excited. A restaurant never only has one item on the menu. They have different items on the menu for different people. So figure out what is on your menu. Yep, so I wanted to share a little bit more as well because Impossible is a very research heavy team. So this is another one of the kind of why us pieces to our, ourselves. So we always keep an eye out on what's happening within the whole space. So uh, something that we always look at is a lot of on-chain analysis and information across the whole sector. And that's one of the things that we do as an advisory of the why us, why do you need to work with as some sort of advisor or accelerator, is that they get to see a lot of things that you don't get time to spend time on when you're trying to solve your own little problems within your own little focus, right? You're, you're designed to be narrow and, and uh, streamlining exactly what you want to solve, but it's always helpful to have some sort of other bird's eye view at some of the other things so you can zoom out sometimes, right? So this is actually for the month of April. Uh, obviously we talked a lot about bear market things, uh, but this graph actually doesn't look super bear to me within the last month, where we've been able to track all the different transaction activity across some of the major chains, and you can see it was actually very steady across all of April uh, for every single one of these chains. Maybe Polygon having a little bit of a dip, but everybody else pretty stable, right? And this is the type of information that as you guys think about which chains you guys want to build on, I know Bowen wants me to add near to this uh, slide already, but I think there's a lot of uh, things that we can still do to be able to help educate all builders to know the ecosystems that they may be deciding to anchor themselves to. Because building in the right chain ecosystem is also one of the biggest catalysts or uh, waves that you can ride. Uh, this is something else I'll come back to related to uh, talking about users. But we actually got even hourly data level, uh, hourly level data on uh, the activity of different chains. So if your project team is trying to solve for a global use case versus a non-global use case, it may actually matter which chain you select. Um, I think the most uh, surprising graph here is how BNB chain and Arbitrum, uh, Arbitrum is this dark blue that is this wave here. Uh, how many of you got an Arbitrum airdrop here? Okay, a pretty good amount, right? And you guys are all currently in Asia time zone. So does it not surprise, it, does it make complete sense if you see the Arbitrum's graph here in this very curve-like shape with a peak roughly at this time zone is very similar to the BMB uh, uh, chart, which you know that BMB, of course, is very Asia-heavy with Binance's presence. And then if you look at something like Ethereum, it's almost perfectly flat, very global and very spread out. And then uh, Optimism, also very spread out, very flat with a peak in uh, 8 a.m. Uh, GMT, uh, similar to Ethereum. So you can actually tell some of the information about the biases or the coverage that different chains may have based on some of the on-chain analytics that 
uh, teams like us can help find for you. So that if you have a focus, let's say, for Asia ecosystem, it may make sense to go bet on a certain chain ecosystem for your project versus if you're trying to build something that's designed to be more global. So happy to chat more on this anytime. Yeah, but being in the right chain ecosystem can be something that helps give you a huge boost. This is Unis Uniswap v3 on Arbitrum, uh, sorry, on Optimism. And by being just an early protocol on Optimism where there weren't any other DEXs, as, Ar uh, as Optimism grew, uh, you can see the trend line of how many users and uh, the total adoption such that Uni v3 became actually uh, one of the largest uh, products uh, on Optimism by being early there. Right? Of course, Op uh, Uniswap is a huge brand anyways, but that you can see how even though op, uh, Uniswap didn't roll out any new upgrades, right? There's not Uniswap v4. Just by being there early, they capture this growth of adoption. And so picking the right chain will be really important in understanding that kind of, um, you don't control every factor in building your project. But if you control some of this or make a conscious decision in finding that fit, you can capture a very valuable audience just by being there. Um, yep, so some things that we see in the bear market, I think some of these points might tie to some of the projects that you guys are working on. Um, we think that bear market is always some of the best time to build, right? Um, but that after proving to all the investors and other supporters of why it should be you, why it should be this problem, the last question is why now? Why should we solve this right now? Because maybe it is a pain that we want to kill for some users, right? Um, so we see a lot of people still building a lot of infrastructure level things and obviously infrastructure level things allow for other people to be able to build even more cool stuff on top, right? Um, and I think that in this current environment, this is like the slide that uh, O shared with us uh, two days ago uh, about the uh, DeFi TVL being zero uh, three, four years ago and now, uh, you know, 49.55x higher than uh, May of 2020, uh, that with a lot of the infrastructure, it opens up these possibilities. If we didn't have maybe the oracles that uh, Chai will share with us later uh, or any of the other infrastructure, maybe you cannot have decentralized uh, perpetual DEXs and things like this. So we're still really excited in every buyer market cycle to see what types of infrastructure will come up. Uh, Bridges was just one example of how we see markets still being maybe not super uh, efficient yet, well, we can see a lot of big bridges now that have billions of, of TVL uh, and also uh, a significant market share in some of the top protocols in this space. So we don't know yet what might be the next bridge or the next base layer infra that we want to see uh, in this space, but that this would be an example of bridges came, became popular last bear market cycle and now have maintained uh, high market shares. I think uh, SCB is an investor in Axelar, so I'll, I'll give a quick shout out there. Uh, but that we can see a lot of things that in last cycle coming out of the bear became cornerstones of things that we use today. Um, obviously, a lot of DeFi use cases, uh, stable coins have still maintained above 100 billion despite the market cycle. So this is my anag analogous page to the DeFi was near zero and stable coins were not very big. But now we have so much more value within this ecosystem, even if we talk about bear markets that, hey, we still have 100 billion in this ecosystem. There are a lot of countries in the world that don't have $100 billion of GDP. We're now something like a valuable country, right, as, as DeFi participants or Web3 participants. And I hope to see us not be worried about the market conditions, but instead feel like this is a country that's still growing. Yep. Uh, so I know uh, we've had some talks from other data players like uh, Plume from Token Unlocks yesterday as well. And I think that we have a few project teams that are also thinking about different data as block, block explorer as a service and so on and so forth. So some of the things that for each of the different uh, initiatives that you guys may be working on, we will think about things about coverage, accuracy, and whatever your standards that you can expect as an industry uh, uh, standard, right? So when I talked to Poom maybe last year when he was first working on Token Unlocks, one of the things that I got him really excited about his problem was talking about how hopefully token unlocks is the standard that project teams should have this level of transparency into all of these different uh, 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 metrics that they should be sharing about their token vesting and, and schedules, right? So when he shared about that wow moment when Coin Bureau was willing to talk about 
um, you know, him on the YouTube channel. That was one small element of how he's setting that standard of what project teams should be sharing so that other people want to share that information on a YouTube channel. That's what hopefully can get you to be really excited about this particular problem and why you want to solve that now. Yeah, uh, lastly, uh, I think uh, a lot of things are still driven on the users or the people that you can hopefully solve these pain points for. Uh, admittedly, I don't think I'm the most user-facing person, so you might need to ask some of our imp impossible teammates here to share more about this. But from a data level, we found, for example, that I believe uh, Polygon, Ethereum, and BNB chain have different most popular days of the week that they're used. And if you can see some of this kind of difference in the users and why they exist on these different chains, asking yourself these types of challenging questions can be really helpful in making sure that you really understand who you're trying to solve versus what all of your competitors might be trying to solve. Um, and then finally, why do you want to help these users out of all users, right? Or why this audience, right? So I think we talked about autonomous worlds and some of the gaming side of things with some of the project teams on the venture builder side here at SV10X. Um, Dark Forest, one of the first games in the fully on-chain world, has about 20,000 visits to its website. Meanwhile, maybe, oh, I think I lost the slide somewhere, but I had a graph of this similar kind of information for, say, DEX aggregators. Uh, I think we have a best X in the room. Uh, some of the biggest DEX aggregators have millions of visits of, of page views. So even though I love gaming and I love on-chain gaming, I have to admit that right now this audience side for on-chain gaming maybe isn't fully there yet, and maybe we need infrastructure for that on-chain gaming to have a million page views for people who want to come to come to your website to address their needs or their pains. And so, yeah, uh, maybe the scale is something that is still growing. So I think, admittedly, we are a little bit dangerously early on betting as a venture builder or incubator on some of the uh, NFT lending side of things. But we actually were the first to make an uh, on-chain lending uh, dashboard on Dune Analytics uh, when maybe it was around here-ish. And then suddenly everyone keeps on talking about our dashboard because it's the only dashboard that checks all of the NFT lending players. There are a few that have like one or two guys built by the individual project teams. And then we said, no, we want to cover everybody. We, we don't want biased information about the sector. And then suddenly now we see that just last month, I believe, uh, Paris Space actually became the biggest NFT uh, lending protocol, right? And you're starting to see some of this traction that maybe now, if you're trying to go into NFT lending, it might be late because now there's eight players that have some uh, traction, right? But maybe half a year ago, when we're back to around here, this was an open fight to be able to be a new player to try and capture some market share. So, yeah. And then uh, one of the really cool things, I think we've got some folks working on some uh, account abstraction and getting rid of these seed phrases. Uh, a cool thing of as we've gotten more and more um, users tapping into the uh, crypto space on more social elements, you can see that I think it was POAP that it took them almost uh, four years to get to one million users in their protocol. And then you can see something like, uh, I think this was uh, Galaxy, I believe, took like 200 days to get uh, a million people, to, a million wallets to interact with their NFTs. So as this space is getting more and more, I guess, easier to onboard users or attract users with NFTs, with other products, we're seeing a lot more social projects be able to get some real scale uh, in a much shorter period of time. Uh, obviously, Socialfy is becoming more and more popular, and I know a lot of you guys are also thinking about some social elements to what you guys are building. Um, and I think this is really important for us to grow this uh, I'll it head count, if, uh, or what, what's the word, uh, population. Uh, uh, given that if I extend this c country analogy of Web3, uh, if you guys are building stuff that helps to immigrate the next wave of people into our ecosystems, this is obviously one of the most valuable infrastructure level things that you can help do for this space. Uh, yeah, this is my point of data. That CoinGecko, there's 30 million people that are already visiting every month to check the prices of their tokens, right? That's still a pretty small country. Uh, I think Thailand has, what, 70, 80 million people? So I guess you can say we're still early, right? Uh, D-Bank, looking at some more on-chain data, is only at 2.7. So you can think of maybe DeFi or Web3 things as like 10% as big as like a small state uh, out of this big country of all crypto people that would check CoinGecko. 
and finally figure out which of these types of audiences is, is the audience that you want to help. Maybe it's this audience, maybe it's this audience, but you need to figure out the why, the how, the why now, all those same questions that we challenged you earlier with. Uh, and then DeFi Llama uh, also being an even smaller subset of each of these, right? Yep, so for us, we have a six step user funnel that we think about of that journey to guide users through uh, getting deeper within crypto. Um, I think it's really helpful to think about these kind of steps or journeys that you might be working on to help your users. Um, and I think that maybe not every user will make it through the whole funnel, but you also need to figure about what is the kind of pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that gets all the users to travel on this rainbow with you. Yeah, and then figure out how we can do it within this uh, scope. I think I typoed it should be this week, uh, but uh, hopefully by the end, we're really looking forward to seeing what you guys build by Saturday, uh, Friday, sorry. Uh, and would love to see uh, if you have any questions uh, on what you guys are building. Feel free to find any of us wearing Impossible t-shirts today. Uh, raise your hand uh, from the Impossible team. Um, so please feel free to drop by and uh, bug us with any of the questions that you guys have. Yeah, uh, definitely um, feel free to ping us as well if you think of a question at 2 a.m. while you're back at your Modena hotel room. Uh, you can just reach out to us on Telegram or Twitter. And uh, yeah, really excited to see all the cool things that you guys build. Uh, how much time do we have for Q&A or no more time? Um, let's have five minutes of Q&A. Yeah, fantastic. All right, thank you so much. And now it's uh, Q&A time. Uh, you Don't guys worry. can have these slides as well. I saw some people taking photos too. Uh -huh. So feel free to scan this QR for this presentation. Yeah, all of the slides uh, will be shared in the Discord as well. So don't worry. All right, and now is the time where you can shoot the question. <laughs> Anyone? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. All right. I'll, I'll do a question. So, I, uh, one question. So, so, I think like the timeline, like if you look back five years, is pretty clear. Like it's still growing, right? But maybe like some some uh, short term drops. Um, but like speaking of like buildings, um, are we expecting to kind of like keep grinding, uh, without you know like minimum traction and usage for the next? I don't know. Is it three years, five years? What What do you think? Like, what's your perspective on on how to think about that? Take on. Uh, Maybe, uh, I would say, w at Impossible, maybe we're not as traction-driven as maybe other VCs. And maybe that's why we're, quote unquote, not a VC. Uh, because some of it is we do feel like there's factors that are what we call from the investment world alpha versus beta. Some things ride the market, and some things are what you work hard on to position yourself so that if there is ever some sort of movement, it's you that captures some of this movement rather than other people, right? Um, and I think an, a great example would be something like, let's, let's say metaverses, for example, that there were a lot of teams that did launch uh, a metaverse at some point, but then uh, some market catalysts like Facebook rebranding the entire company to meta and forcing every headline in the news of the whole world to talk about metaverses. All the project teams that had been positioned to be uh, launched prior to that uh, capture some of the market beta of moving along with the sector of uh, metaverses, right? Um, and so in some ways, some of these numbers like traction, sure, it'd be great if you guys have 5,000 users, but I think I would love to challenge you guys to think more about the why now uh, slides that we had before and the why use, <coughs> because if we look at something like a NFT lending, for example, and if you told me that at this point in time, you uh, sold your board ape at two ETH because you needed money and then you didn't get a chance to borrow something again against uh, this board ape. And it's a really painful experience that you feel like now you want to prevent the next NFT holder from selling their NFT too early. You have a great story and you might capture a very early seed at this table where I think this week NFT Fi mentioned that they are also doing a retroactive airdrop. These guys early on are able to now tell a magnificent story and capture a lot of the growth of this sector. And so in some way, I think it's important to figure out the why to exist 
before you figure out what is the scale of the problem that you want to have because you can always figure out another reason to, to solve some problem, but you need to always stick with what that why is, right? So when I go all the way back to what is impossible, I always can think back to that first page, right? The, the fairness, accessibility, and high quality here. Because if I have the why, and I'm honest in wanting to solve this problem, I think I can find any problems that are related to this. But if you start maybe from just a market sizing thing and you see so many of those uh, pitch decks with the uh, uh, target adjustable market and this is exactly the 10 billion growth of this sector in the future, you might not figure out why you have a, maybe a how and these other things. And I think that was one of the challenges I had uh, when first starting Impossible that a lot of my teammates like Seb really challenged me on don't just say the how, what's the why? The question above that, a how comes after a why. So figure out your why and then figure out the why us, and then figure out the why now, all these different whys, before you figure out the how. I think that's actually something that I think will keep you guys sane in the things that you want to build, but also figure out like your kind of general direction that will really be super supportive in your journey as a, as a builder. Everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, you have mentioned a lot about educating users or uh, like people. So I think that, that that's a great thing that a lot of uh, builders try to try to do. And as as you said, many, many times I found uh, like good resources, so I learned a lot from that. Uh, users love this, but as a builder or like uh, us, to every time we, we educate people, we need to spend some resources from from outside, right? So. It, it has some drawbacks, so can you share me, us more about uh, like drawback to avoid when, when you educate some people? Yeah. Mm, those are a great question. <coughs> um, I think that there's no one way to solve this. Uh, I'll kind of shout out how, for example, I think we have uh, seven teammates here today. Um, I'll shout out Maxim, our, our teammate from Russia who came uh, here this time as well. Um, that he has a Russian community chat where I would say he manually answers a lot of the questions just in a Telegram chat, right? But it's something that got us to know how much he cares about this community and also something where we can show people that in different sectors uh, or different kind of approaches, we're here to help you educate. We're, we are here, right? Um, I would say we haven't done this in a lot of the other countries that we have but Russia is actually one of our largest user bases, uh, thanks to some of the work that Maxim has been able to do within our community, right? Um, and then for example, uh, our tech team has built a lot of FAQs and other uh, informational links. Uh, we have other teammates that did video content as well to <coughs> explain and walk through how users grow. Uh, Gareth back there has created Notion templates if people prefer screenshots and step-by-step -step explainers. Uh, Seb, our lawyer, has thought about how to protect users in different ways in case there is a bad project that happens to come through our launch pad, things like this. And so every teammate, I think, has different ways where they contribute with their skill set to be able to answer some of these questions, right? Uh, so that it, it's not ever going to be just one copy-paste. And I hope that you actually have a variety of different people on your teams to be able to solve the same problem in different ways. But this is also one of the ways where we're diversified in solving it so that every user, when they come with a different problem, we have a different link, a different uh, program, a different thing to protect them, uh, to support them, to educate them, right? Um, and I think that's something that hopefully you guys, I know your, your teams are still relatively small, uh, but that hopefully as you guys scale and as you guys solve more of these different problems, you figure out how are the different ways that your unique teammates can contribute to the same kind of questions of something like an education. Because if you put everybody into education in like the same exact program, that's why I think it's really expensive. Because maybe it's expensive because that teammate is not very good at doing this particular thing. Maybe they're even better at doing first the product and letting somebody else create some of the documentation or things like this to help explain to the user what is going on, right? So figuring out the different ways that people uh, participate in each initiative is something I think it took us at Impossible quite a long time to figure out or maybe we're still figuring out, uh, but it's something that hopefully you guys will figure out even earlier in your uh, startup journeys. All right. Uh, can I have one, one last question? Okay, I, I have a question. 
So as we uh, have already heard from you, uh, have already seen your passion in educating the new users, the next billion users into the crypto investment and other kind of investments as well to have a fair and accessible digital financial ecosystem. Uh, two years ago, I also launched a DeFi uh, product as well. Uh, it failed within <laughs> four months. And I think the, the question here is, uh, do you have like any shared resource or somewhere that you can point to that maybe we can use that material in order to educate our new users as well? Because back then I have to uh, write my own like uh, more than 10 blocks about how to swap, how to invest, uh, how to do uh, road, uh, do the roadmap and stuff, the white paper, you know. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, great question. I think, uh, for example, we have a guide that we already wrote where I think Gareth and the rest of the team created a guide of how to connect MetaMask. Mm. Some of your users maybe have never used MetaMask before. I guess you can. Uh, technically, our, mm. our uh, notion is public, so you can just link straight to it, right? <laughs> now, but this would be one of the ways to save some of your cost or time of education. Mm -hmm. Find some of these explainers and just put a link, right? Users mm. will click the link if they don't know how. And give credit. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the link usually will, these teams that have created something like this, they'll probably put their logo somewhere. Uh -huh. It's okay, right? As long as the user now knows how to do it, great, right? So I think th these are some of the materials that I think that are already out there, not just from ourselves, but from other project teams as well. Maybe, um, maybe for example, Band Protocol maybe have some guides on how to use something in Cosmos ecosystem since they're a Cosmos-based chain. So every team, every ecosystem may have different folks where you maybe can draw on some of their resources to help in onboarding. I think for some of the uh, uh, general project uh, help, I think we've actually talked a little bit about this internally, but I think we can still do a better job at this. But actually making, for example, these slides open uh, or putting them out so that other people can enjoy them, that's something that I hope that we as an incubator can also do a better job at as well. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty excited because this is a challenge that I think we still need to do during hopefully the rest of this year as well to give mm -hmm. more resources that are just open for every teammate, uh, every builder out there to share with their teammates and save some of their teammates time. Uh, because that's also one of the ways that we can capture some branding as an accelerator, that we are genuinely here to help other projects. So uh, you've given me a good challenge to push for the rest of the team.